For decades, a terrifying and faceless figure has appeared to countless witnesses during dissociative episodes or between waking states. Unsettlingly, these sightings have increased exponentially in the last several years, and witness descriptions remain bizarrely consistent. A shadow person manifests in the darkest recesses of a room. It wears a brimmed hat above a featureless face with no discernible nose or mouth. It towers over its victims, staring, and its presence feels malevolent. Witnesses are paralyzed by fear, unable to scream for help until the hat man slowly fades away, leaving them alone in the darkness to contend with what they saw. Encounters with the hat man have spread like wildfire through Reddit and TikTok, yet still we are no closer to understanding what is the hat man and why are so many sharing the same waking nightmare. The Hat Man is only the newest iteration of an archetype that has existed since antiquity, the archetype of a looming shadowy figure that appears in the fugue of sleep or dissociation. The earliest appearance of this archetype came from pre-Islamic Arabia in the form of jinn, who were powerful and invisible spirits that lived in a world that overlapped with our own. They were invisible, but they could manifest into physical forms through shape-shifting. They could become animals, objects, or people. Descriptions of the jinn are even mentioned within the Quran. Many of these earliest beliefs about the jinn share commonalities with the hat man. It's believed that jinn become more active at night. They are capable of harming and even killing their victims, and one specific jinn Al Jathum brings nightmares and sleep paralysis to its victims. The symptoms of this attack include pain or weight on the chest and shortness of breath. Latin cultures share folklore of similar creatures known as incubus and succubus. These entities are similar in appearance, often depicted in paintings as impish and demonic. Victims claim to be unable to move in their beds as these entities approach and perch on their chests. They would experience hallucinations, difficulty breathing, and deep feelings of dread. These entities are also said to assault victims of the opposite sex. Stretching across countries, cultures, and centuries, this archetype has presented in multiple forms under countless names. The most modern iteration of this archetype appeared in the early 2000s. In April 2001, Art Bell conducted an interview with a First Nation elder on a broadcast of Coast to Coast AM. The two spoke at length about shadow people, and they encouraged listeners to submit drawings of these entities. Later that year, Heidi Hollis published a book coining the phrase shadow people in print Hollis recounted witness testimonials from people who had interacted with these entities previously. These beings were described as living shadows, humanoid figures with indiscernible features. They would appear in the corner of a room or at the edges of vision, and they would remain immobile, simply watching. Or they would traverse the space as if they were unaware of anyone else in the room. These stories began to saturate paranormal message boards and forums and they became further signal boosted by additional paranormal authors, investigators, and media personalities. A few years after shadow people were popularized in modern American culture, a trend emerged among these testimonials. Many witnesses claimed that they saw a shadow person wearing a brimmed hat and sometimes an outdated coat. The figure was dubbed the Hat Man and was described as a malevolent being that brought feelings of intense dread. Bizarrely, unlike descriptions of other shadow people, 
the hat man seemed intrigued by observers, always watching them. As stories of the hat man became increasingly popular, Timothy Brown created the Hat Man Project in 2009. Its purpose was to aggregate witness sightings and establish some sort of broader public understanding after his own experience, which is abbreviated here. What I saw gripped me immediately with fear and dread. I saw a tall human-like figure, and the figure looked like that of a man. The man had no distinguishable features whatsoever. I could see no eyes, no nose or mouth, only blackness. He looked like a shadow, only darker, much darker. He had a very wide-brimmed hat and a long trench coat that flowed as he moved. He leaned his head and body into my great-grandmother's room and looked in turning his head toward her and then toward me. I had my eyes closed as much as I could, so I could still see him, and yet, still, looked like I was sleeping. He stood there for what seemed like an eternity, just staring. He then moved very slowly and without sound back into the hallway, just out of view. As I kept watching, I then saw this blacker-than-black figure move toward my grandmother's room. Just like before, he leaned his body and head in her doorway, looking at her, again not making a sound. He then leaned back and moved out of view into the hallway. Witnesses began posting consistently on the site in 2012. These stories are submitted via a form on the website and reviewed by Brown before publication. It's worth noting that this screening process could lead to biases during sample collection and enforce patterns that may not exist. For example, if a few stories characterize the hat man as benevolent or talkative, would they be excluded because they don't match the current cultural preconceptions about this entity? Over the years, stories of the hat man began to metastasize beyond online paranormal communities. 4chan and Reddit began to buzz with testimonials. The majority of the hat man sightings happened before falling asleep or after waking up during the night. However, it wasn't long before a new method of meeting the hat man was discovered, one that would end up taking multiple lives. The subreddit rdph was established in 2014 to discuss the recreational and experimental use of diphenhydramine. This drug, commonly known by its brand name Benadryl, is an over-the-counter antihistamine and sedative that is commonly used to treat a variety of conditions, including allergies and insomnia. However, at much larger doses, it can function as an anticholinergic. Anticholinergic drugs block acetylcholine, which transmits messages in the nervous system and brain. It's involved in learning and memory, as well as muscle contraction and coordination. These larger doses can cause delirium, which is characterized by confusion, disorientation, and hallucination. Diphenhydramine is a deliriant, not a psychedelic. Although both cause hallucinations, Delirients cause greater disturbances in motor function, emotional and perceptual processing, and more. Delirients are much more destructive to the human body and mind. Individuals who frequently abuse delirients are known as delvers. Before discussing the connection between diphenhydramine and hatman, it's important to understand the danger and lethality of diphenhydramine abuse. The following is a cautionary tale of a young man who tragically fell into the trap of DPH. Nearly three years ago, the user, tired of people faking too, created his first post titled, How Has DPH Affected Your Life? While this post and many others have been removed by moderators, they have been copied and pasted elsewhere. TOPF2 was interested in exploring hallucinogenics, 
but didn't have the money or means. He searched for cheap and legal alternatives, and tragically, he began to experiment with diphenhydramine. His addiction arrived swiftly, and his first post reads as follows. I did not end up taking DPH until February 15th, 2019. My first trip was on 450 milligrams, and it was horrible, honestly. I wasn't smart about it at all. I remember taking it with six cans of beer around 11 p.m. under some random highway. I remember walking aimlessly around town, kept falling, kept slurring my speech, and ended up asking the local PD to drive me to the ER. It was pretty stupid of me, but anyways, since February 15th, I've probably ingested over a thousand pills of DPH, and my tolerance has gotten extremely high. Later that month, TOPF2 made three separate posts that detailed his plans to take dosages between 2,000 and 4,000 milligrams, which is between 80 and 160 times the recommended dosage. These posts reflect a great deal of personal despair and self-loathing, explicitly stating that he is unworried about his chances for survival at these high dosages. He was offline for three months, but eventually returned with a progress update on his addiction in the following post. For all the newbies and curious people that want to try DPH, I highly recommend y'all quit before you start, or quit now before it gets very bad. I wish I could have broken my habit a long time ago, but the past is the past, so I can't change that. If y'all really want to do it though, I gotta tell you some things that happened to me while taking DPH. DPH has landed me in the ICU, intubated and comatose from dangerous heart arrhythmias, severe respiratory depression, and seizures three times in the past year. DPH has caused me to have permanent short-term memory loss at the age of 20. DPH is very addictive, which makes it hard to stay clean from it. DPH has ruined my ability to learn at school efficiently, like I used to be able to and it has made it very hard for me to perform well at my job. Over the next seven months, he continued to post about trip dosages of 1.5 grams and higher, memes about diphenhydramine addiction, and polls to connect with other users. The mood of these posts fluctuates between indifference and self-contempt for his deteriorating mental and physical health. His trip logs demonstrate ever-increasing dosages, including details of overdoses and hospitalizations. In the following months, he remained active within the community, frequently responding to posts written by other users, including one mention of an interaction with the hat man. Less than a year after he started posting, tired of people faking too, made the following post an image of 276 pills equivalent to 6.9 grams, and the question, why the hell not? Then, he went silent. Tragically, the size of his final dose and lack of subsequent posts imply that he finally succumbed to his addiction, and he wasn't alone. The Benadryl Challenge emerged, a viral TikTok trend that promoted the consumption of exceedingly high doses of DPH, resulting in a surge of diphenhydramine poisoning cases. TikTok has since deactivated the corresponding hashtags and taken down videos promoting the challenge, and the FDA published a public warning about the potential dangers of Benadryl abuse. However, the damage was done. The RDPH subreddit nearly doubled in subscribers in just over a year. The sidebar includes a link to a user guide outlining the effects and experiences at different dosages. It includes an unofficial survey conducted by the original poster. Bizarrely, the survey concluded that nearly 50% of Delvers witnessed shadow people and over 20% witnessed the hat man. 
The Hatman has appeared throughout the last several decades, manifesting to witnesses in the throes of parasomnia or addiction. How can so many people report the same experience with the same apparition? There are several theories that may explain these terrifying sightings, ranging from the natural to the supernatural. Many of the eyewitness accounts take place in the middle of the night with the hat man appearing in the bedrooms of those who are either falling asleep or waking up. Subsequently, a common explanation for the hat man and his earlier archetypes is sleep paralysis. During REM sleep, skeletal muscles in the body are naturally paralyzed through GABA and glycine neurotransmitters acting on motor neurons. This function is likely meant to prevent injury during a dreaming experience. Sleep paralysis is an eerie phenomenon that occurs when a person is conscious but still paralyzed. This experience is made even more frightening by intense feelings of fear and vivid hallucinations. The combination of the two often create nightmarish realities for those who are still trapped between sleeping and waking life. While this may account for some of the witness sightings discussed, it does not address sightings induced by diphenhydramine abuse. However, in the 2016 paper titled What is the Link Between Hallucinations, Dreams, and Hypnagogic Hypnopompic Experiences, Waters et al. identified dysregulated acetylcholine as a key neurotransmitter involved in sleep paralysis and delirium. Bizarrely, sleep paralysis is characterized by high levels of acetylcholine, and delirium is characterized by low levels of acetylcholine. As a reminder, diphenhydramine is an anticholinergic, which means it lowers acetylcholine in the brain. Is it possible that dysregulated acetylcholine as the result of parasomnia or delirium are the cause of Hatman sightings, a shared hallucination induced through chemical imbalances in the brain? It is important to consider the role that cultural preconceptions play in the shaping of these sightings. The internet has allowed for the easy spread of information. It has also made it easier for people to connect with others who have had similar experiences, leading to the formation of online communities. As witnesses consume the aggregated witness accounts on TikTok, Reddit, and 4chan, they are more likely to have that same experience. This can create a feedback loop where preconceptions and cultural narratives are reinforced and perpetuated. This is a process known as ostention, whereby a folklore legend is manifested or made real simply by telling its story. As experiences of the hat man are shared, they are also more likely to be experienced. It's important to note that there may be intersections between cultural and biological explanations. For example, the Hmong people who are indigenous to East-Southeast Asia have astronomically high rates of sleep paralysis, sleep apnea, and chillingly, sudden unexplained nocturnal death syndrome, or SUNS. Culturally, the Hmong people believe in an entity known as Dab Sog. This entity is believed to crush the chest of its victims and steal their breath. Are these stories of the Dab Sog meant to explain biological predispositions to sleep disorders among the Hmong people? Or do the cultural beliefs in the Dab Sog lead to psychosomatic symptoms? Horrifyingly, what if the cause of these sightings is something far more sinister? Something beyond our understanding of reality? What if the Hat Man is real? Many modern scholars and investigators of paranormal phenomenon have proposed the interdimensional hypothesis, which suggests that other dimensions overlap with our own, and inexplicably, entities or experiences can occur as a glimpse between the two dimensions. It is their belief that some entities are capable of crossing over from another dimension into our own. Similar to the Mothman, the Hatman may be an extra-dimensional being, existing outside the limits of our world. 
He would not be constrained by our physical laws and his intentions would be unknowable. The interdimensional hypothesis and the hat man himself raise questions about the very nature of reality, unsettling questions that have yet to be answered. Despite the growing number of reported sightings, the hat man's true nature, cause, and motivation remain a mystery. The idea of a sinister being appearing in the shadows of empty rooms is a chilling one. As more people come forward with their own encounters, it becomes clear that this phenomenon demands further investigation. Until then, the hat man will continue to linger in the shadows, his features hauntingly indiscernible, a dark and malevolent presence that keeps us awake at night, reminding us of the things we cannot explain. Thank you.